Well, I'm going to entertain as if, uh, that's right, we just have, uh, uh, why don't we, we'll, we'll start off, we'll go from Mr. Tillman and move, move this way. Tell me, you're, you're fine with that as far as an opening remark? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Jerome Tillman will, um, will do his first introduction. It's a three-minute introduction, Jerome. We have timekeeper. Uh, you might look for the card signaling 30 <laughs> seconds. Okay, who's flashing the card? Right there. All right. Okay, that's three minutes start. Thank you. Jerome Tillman is my name, candidate for the 16th okay. Congressional District here in uh, the county of El Paso. Uh, I rarely speak to cause people to come to their feet. I speak to cause people to come to their senses. If we take a look at the track record that has been amassed over the careers of both other parties on this platform, we'll take a look at some numbers that cause us to say, we need to take a second look at who we put in charge. If you take a look as an example, the unemployment rate is at 11%, higher than the state average, higher than the national average. Per capita income in the 16th Congressional District is 30% below the national average. Median income, there's a $23,000 gap between the rest of America and what we've made in El Paso. Those are causes for concern that we all need to pay attention to. The economic, political, and social salvation of this community and this country is in the classroom right now. We need to pay a lot more attention to how we educate this community so we can elevate it above the lower rung levels of poverty and social despair and unemployment. This candidacy represents a way to lift up the labor force, improve its classification, and improve the socioeconomic and political future of this community and this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Drew. Did you this Sure. Thanks. Good morning. It's uh, great to be with you all here today. Great to see so many people out early on a Monday morning who are interested in this race and interested in El Paso's future. And it's truly an honor to be running to represent you in the U.S. Congress. My name is Beto O'Rourke. I'm a lifelong El Pasoan, born and raised here, and very proud to be from El Paso. I started a business here in 1999, Stanton Street Technology Group in downtown El Paso. And over the last 12 years, I've employed dozens of El Pasoans in high-wage, high-technology jobs here in our community. During that time, I've also volunteered and served on nonprofit boards from community scholars to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce to service organizations like the Rotary Club. In 2005, I ran for and won a seat on the El Paso City Council. And during the six years that I served on that city council, I focused on quality of life issues, economic development opportunities, and doing everything I could to make El Paso the most competitive city it could possibly be. And in every one of those six years, we passed a balanced budget. In September, I decided to, uh, made the decision to run for U.S. Congress to represent you and your interests in Washington, D.C. And from that point until today, I've been knocking on doors, talking to fellow El Pasoans, people just like you and me, to find out what their priorities are so that I can make them my priorities. And here they are. There are three of them. Number one is jobs and the economy. There is absolutely no reason that 35,000 of our fellow El Pasoans should be out of work right now. We have too many amazing opportunities in this community to have an almost 11% unemployment rate. You think about our ports of entry, across which... Uh, past $70 billion in U.S.-Mexico trade. You think about the base expansion at Fort Bliss and all the economic opportunity there. And you think about long-term potential in areas like the Medical Center of the Americas. With the right leadership in the right places, including at our congressional level, we can expand and capitalize on those opportunities and bring more jobs and economic opportunity to El Paso. The second issue is veterans. We have over 80,000 veterans in this area, and yet in 2008 we were ranked the worst VA system in the country. We should be the best VA system in the country, both for those people who put their lives on the line for us and for the 35,000 active duty soldiers and their families who at some point will make a decision on where they, they're going to retire. We want them to retire here in El Paso, Texas. And the last thing that I hear people want 
is a full-time, full-service congressman who's working for El Paso and putting El Paso's interests first. That means showing up to vote. That means passing bills that moves this community's agenda forward. And that means being accountable and responsive to the people who sent you up to Washington. That's the kind of congressman that I want to be for you. And, I, and I'm asking for your vote today, and I appreciate your attention and your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, and, and good morning to all of you. And I also want to welcome you here and appreciate you being up uh, early with us uh, on this morning, Monday morning. And if you read the paper this morning, today begins the filing date after a long process of uh, uh, deb talking about the redistricting and uh, fitting four new seats uh, into the state of Texas. I'm Congressman Reyes, and I've had the privilege and the honor of representing you for the last uh, 15 years going on the sixth, 16th year next year. That's eight terms. I've always had three priorities throughout my tenure in Congress. The first one is to protect and preserve our national defense, important to us here because of Fort Bliss. Uh, the second one, education. Jerome is right, we need to focus on education. And although uh, at the federal level we provide uh, on the low end 6% to 8% of the uh, monies for education, so it's largely a state issue, but we can weigh in, and we have weighed in uh, on on education at uh, different times uh, with federal funding. And then the third one is the border. I'm proud to have served this country both as uh, uh, in the Army uh, and as a uh, veteran of Vietnam, and also 26 and a half years in the United States Border Patrol, retiring in 1995 uh, as a chief here uh, in El Paso. Uh, for me, it was important uh, to uh, go to Congress because I felt that I had a unique background, uh, better understanding of border issues than perhaps anybody else in, in Congress. The reason I say that is because as the chief down in McAllen for nine years and three and a half years here in El Paso, I got the opportunity uh, to brief and testify before over uh, 40 members of Congress. So when I went to Congress, when I got elected and went to Congress, I had those relationships uh, uh, with uh, those members on both sides of the aisle. When I got to Congress, the first thing that shocked me was that Fort Bliss was about to be bracked out and uh, was about to close. So it fell upon me to come up with a strategy to, to protect Fort Bliss because Fort Bliss, uh, about 60% of that economy, uh, of the Fort Bliss uh, economy uh, touches here uh, uh, El Paso. So we did that. Uh, we put together a strategy, we called it Team El Paso, and then now Team Bliss, uh, but uh, we were very, very uh, focused on saving uh, Fort Bliss. Today I'm proud to be recognized as a, uh, the only member of Congress that's an expert on border issues. I, w I just traveled to Alabama last uh, week uh, with, other, with 10 other members of Congress uh, to take public testimony on the impact of the Alabama law that is uh, very anti-minority and very anti-immigrant, much like Arizona and also Georgia. So there's a lot at stake in this race uh, uh, here. I've got a track record that I'm proud of. I'm a Democrat. I've worked with the party. I've been a major influence uh, every election cycle. Uh, and so I think as Democrats, we all need to look at what the track record is, our involvement with the party, and what our vision is. It's not enough to say you want change. What you've got to do is uh, articulate the vision that you have and how you're going to change uh, this community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. <laughs> now we'll move into the question stage of this, uh, this debate. And I, I would like to start with Dr. Stout, Stout on the first question. The first question is this. Why do you want this job? And I didn't design that question. Some of you already answered it, but uh, that is the first question on our list. And we'll start with the Congress. Okay. First and, first and foremost, uh, this is a great honor to represent the people of the 16th District. Did you get a chance to weigh in on uh, issues that are important to Texas and important to the nation? and? As we know, in today's world, we face a very dangerous asymmetrical threat 
post 9-11. I have the honor of serving on the Armed Services Committee and on the Veterans Committee. Uh, first and foremost, we need to make sure under these difficult uh, financial and budget uh, uh, situations, we need to make sure that uh, whoever represents this district uh, is able to influence uh, and to complete the funding for uh, the William Beaumont uh, Hospital. We've done all the BRAC things. You can see the results of the work that I did in my very first term by the expansion of, of Fort Bliss. But today, we need to make sure that we follow through on William Beaumont uh, at an, an investment of $1.2 billion. These are tough economic times that we're going to have to, uh, and could I just stop right there? Because it's, as I understood it, we have a, a minute and a half? Uh, three minutes, actually. For each, each answer? Yes. Oh, that's different. Okay. Did you choose. Oh, good. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so uh, uh, it's very important that we focus on the challenges that we're gonna that we're gonna see in the next Congress. Uh, funding is going to be a big issue because of the the uh, deficit that that we have, and because uh, in 2013, if we don't change the law. Uh, there are going to be across-the-board cuts on all the different programs. A difficult issue there for us will be uh, protecting the investments that we have in Fort Bliss, particularly uh, William Beaumont. Uh, part of the reason that uh, I want to continue to represent this community is because I have done everything that I can. My voting record, since one of my opponents brought that up, I've, uh, my voting record is 92% lifetime. I don't know about the Ivy League, but in Canutillo, 92% is an A. So that's my lifetime. This, this term, I'm at over 96%. I take this job seriously. This is an important job because you're talking about the top democratic job here in this, in this county. You get an opportunity to help others. You get an opportunity to address issues that are critical and vital, like the border. Uh, last year, because I was still chairman of the Intelligence uh, Committee, uh, I led the effort to put in an additional 60, six, $600 million for border uh, uh, enforcement and border ports of entry. We hired 250, although we wanted 500, we hired 250 inspectors for the ports of entry because uh, uh, we've been focused on uh, uh, in between the ports of entry with Border Patrol. Now we need to switch that to address the infrastructure and the inspections for uh, the ports of entry. So that's uh, the reason that I want to continue to work for you. It's a privilege and an honor. Thank you. I'm running for this position because I believe that El Paso is the center of the universe. I think that we have the greatest opportunities and some of the greatest challenges in this community. And unfortunately, we do not have leadership at all levels of government that are making the great things that are possible here happen. Let me give you a few examples. We talked about the ports of entry. We still have 10 years after 9-11, three hour lines for people who are waiting for the privilege of spending their hard earned dollars in our economy. Wadenzin spend $1.5 billion in the El Paso economy every year. More than 20% of all U.S.-Mexico trade passes through our ports of entry. And yet we've seen no significant movement in those lines, no improvement in that situation, and 50,000 jobs here in El Paso are at stake. We can either grow those jobs or we can lose those jobs if we don't get that fixed. And we have not gotten it fixed despite Congressman Reyes being there for 16 years. You look at our situation with the VA. Why with 80, 000, over 80,000 veterans in our community should we have the worst ranked VA system in the country? Why does Big Spring, Texas have a VA hospital? Why does Albuquerque, New Mexico have a VA hospital? Why does El Paso, Texas not have a VA hospital? That's leadership, and we need leadership in Washington, D.C. right now. You know, this position is too critical and too important to not have somebody who's working full time for El Paso. And since the Congressman brought this point up, I'd like to respond. 95% of the U.S. Congress has a better voting record than Sylvester Reyes. 95% of the U.S. Congress shows up more often to vote on the issues that come before the Congress than he does. He's missed votes on the VA system. He's missed votes on armed services issues. He missed the vote to 
offer health care to the first responders at 9-11. Those are votes that are critical for our country, and those are votes that are critical for our community. So I don't care if you live in Canyoteo or anywhere else in El Paso County. That's an embarrassment. And we need somebody who's going to be there full time, who's going to be working hard for El Paso, and who's going to make great things happen for this community. And I want to be that person, and that's why I'm running for this office. Thank you, and uh, I think we all have good reasons. I believe our heart is invested in the direction and destiny of this community and the direction and destiny of this country. Uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the things that I heard uh, Congressman Reyes mention is important and significant. Pretty good track record for supporting the Democratic Party over the years and wanting to make sure that those views and values are represented at the national level. As a matter of fact, I met Ken Sutherland in my, my baptism under fire. I was driving voters to the polls uh, in 1992 in a thunderstorm. There were four people at the Democratic headquarters, me, Jose Rodriguez, Jaime Espaza, and the chair. The next year, I uh, went down to the convention for the state. We had some problems in nominations and rules committee. I got voted on by the entire delegation that was on the floor to make sure that we did not have issues and concerns that would stop our full delegation to go in and be represented. <coughs> the delegation elected me to go down, reopen the meetings, and then get all of our delegates put on the floor. Why am I running? Part of the reason that I want to speak to, for the, the reason that Congressman Ray has mentioned, we do have some, some financial problems, but those financial problems are based on the dysfunction and the reputation report card that the National Congress has. It's, a, it's an international embarrassment to take a look at a 8%, 9% approval rate over a period of time that has produced the economic and unemployment numbers that we have, the $14 trillion deficit that we have, the fact that we have two and a half wars on credit cards. We talk about downscaling wars uh, in Iraq only to begin to stand up in Central uh, Africa. Those are not the kinds of things that speak to the direction that we should be taking in this community and this country when we have the infrastructure problems that we have. Uh, my background here in public service, my background here in military service, and my background and service as a professional <coughs> educator are all things that need to be taught to a dysfunctional, non-communicating Congress that causes the community and the country to suffer. And that's why I'm running for the 16th Congressional District. Yes. Next, we're going to direct this question to, to Mr. Tillman again to start on that side of the table. So I'll have to modify this question then. Um, to uh, Representative O'Rourke and Mr. Tillman, as freshman reps, how would you bring tangible results to our community? And to Congressman Reyes, after 16 years in office, what do you see that is left to accomplish? I think one of the key lessons that needs to take place at the national level, uh, I, uh, I can address by my experiences in 21 years of professional military service, special operations, and been in the theater of operations that many people in Congress only talk about and envision. Uh, there are those who, when they go into those places where we're spending so much of our money, only have a peripheral knowledge of what it's like to deploy a soldier and bring that soldier back. We need to be able to talk to people who do not have that level of familiarity because we have people in Congress right now who treat soldiers like email. They're quick to push the send button but have no clear indication, no clear understanding of what it means to send a soldier into a combat zone, bring that soldier out, and to take a look at the economic cost tangibly in dollars and cents, and then the immeasurable cost of the psychological and physical damages that that soldier will have to incur over time. We need to take a look at the way we discuss problem resolution. We have too many in Congress, I think, who are more focused on keeping their jobs than keeping their word, that being able to go in and speak to a Congress about the value of dialogue, compromise, and consensus is certainly a key issue that I will bring to the table, having had those experiences and experienced those successes here in El Paso County.
You've heard me already speak often about jobs, the economy, and veterans issues. And I've kept that list short because I want to be held accountable for things that I think I can move forward for this community. And those, I believe, are the most important issues in our community. And I've heard that directly from the voters who are going to decide this election. I think that I've shown in my time on the city council and in my time in the business community as a small business owner and in my time in the civic and nonprofit sector that I can work with and will work with and have worked with people from all stripes, backgrounds, and interests, whether it's the business community, whether it's the nonprofit and activist community, whether it's other political leaders on city council that I worked with. I work to build coalitions, and I'm happy to work with anyone, anywhere, anytime to move El Paso's agenda forward. And so I will focus on, and I'll ask you to hold me accountable for, the things that I'm campaigning on. Jobs, 35,000 people unemployed right now, almost 11% of our workforce, unacceptable. Texas is 8%, the U.S. is 9%. Where I will focus is our bridges. There's 50,000 jobs in El Paso, dependent on the economic activity that crosses those bridges. I'll focus on Fort Bliss, more than $5 billion in economic activity spinning out of the projects and construction at that base, and yet much of it, if not most of it, is leaving town with out-of-town contractors and subcontractors when you have El Pasoans who are desperate for those jobs right here in this community. I'll go to bat for those El Pasoans. And lastly, the Medical Center of the Americas, truly the greatest long-term hope for job creation and economic growth in our community, the kinds of jobs that our young people right now are leaving El Paso to go to other communities and enrich their cities and states and communities. We invest there, we can end up like Houston, which has the Texas Medical Center, which employs 93,000 people, 20,000 of which are in high paid, white collar, technicians, doctors, medical staff, researchers and scientists. We need those kind of jobs here in El Paso if we're gonna keep our town and our young people. So those are the kind of things that I'll focus on and I will work with Republicans, I will work with Democrats, I will work with, with whomever we need to work with to move this community agenda forward. That's what I bring to the table. That's what's been missing so far. Well, thank you. I, I will remind all of us that in my first term, uh, I went to Congress in 97 with the Republicans uh, in control of both the House uh, and the Senate. The work that I did to bring about the success at Fort Bliss uh, was done uh, by working across the aisle, by working with uh, chairmen like uh, Duncan Hunter, who I had met uh, previously as a, as a chief. So I have that track record as well, working across the aisle. But I never forget, and I never lose sight of my democratic values. I, I am proud to be a Democrat because I think in this position, you have the ability to give uh, voice to those that are in this community that otherwise would be uh, without, a, without a voice. So as a Democrat, I'm proud uh, of my record. What's left to be done? We need to continue uh, on uh, developing the infrastructure, both uh, locally here in terms of roads, bridges, highways, uh, because the good news is we're, we're thriving in terms of the build out of Fort Bliss and all of the changes that that has, has brought. Uh, on the bad news side, we have to complete all the infrastructure uh, projects. I voted, I voted for the Stimulus Act. The Stimulus Act that uh, brought into this community over a billion dollars and we were able to move up projects here uh, that were long term projected to be 20 years down the road. The reason the East Side uh, Spaghetti Bowl is being built is because of the vote that I took on the <coughs> Stimulus Act and the 90 six million dollars that that act contributed uh, to uh, the east side. Uh, so we need to continue to, to focus. I know the ports of entry. I worked those ports of entry for four years. So when somebody talks about the challenges that are faced, this is one member of Congress, the only member of Congress that understands those challenges firsthand. The VA, I'm a veteran. I have a VA account. I can tell you that Veterans get the best health care here at, at the Veterans Center. My, one of my opponents mentioned that in 2008 there were issues. Yes, there were issues of leadership. I immediately weighed in, brought the chairman of the VA committee in here, and we made those changes. 
veterans are proud of the work of the of the healthcare that they that they get there. I am also proud to tell you that uh, I was one member of Congress that stood up and voted against going into Iraq. Imagine the, how tough that vote was. But I think uh, I think it was the right vote, and and history has shown that that was the right vote. When we talk about contracts at Fort Bliss, almost half a billion dollars uh, have uh, local contractors have gotten there at Fort Bliss. And when we talk about contract uh, people that come in here, they hire local people. Imagine what the unemployment rate would have been uh, here under the tough economic circumstances where Detroit and other places were at 34 percent unemployment. Thank you. The next question um, coming from uh, Mr. Moore will, will be directed back to uh, Congressman Reyes. I'm assuming everybody can hear me, so uh, forgive me if not. Uh, uh, and I'm going to modify this question just a little bit, too, to, to uh, make it relevant to the, to the various candidates. Uh, the, the question is about the committees you'd like to serve on if elected, and I think Congressman Reyes is in a different situation since we already have two committee assignments. But I'd like to, to talk about how you would use uh, your next term in Congress uh, on a committee to uh, benefit El Paso. Yeah. Well, as I said, I'm the second most senior Democratic member on the Armed Services Committee. If there's ever been a time to have a champion for El Paso in the Armed Services Committee, this is it. Why? Because we've already uh, seen the Department of Defense take uh, uh, about 480, 460 to 80 million dollars worth of cuts already. In the next Congress, if we don't fix the current uh, law, then sequestration kicks in, which means that across the board, every single program will be cut. Every single program. I don't, I don't agree with that because I think that if we're going to, are there, first of all, let me just say, are there areas in the Department of Defense that we can look at to make additional cuts? Yes, absolutely. But when the law says that every program is going to take a cut uh, proportionately, you're talking about uh, funding half a submarine, half an aircraft carrier, uh, half a, of a future combat systems program. It can't be done. So I'm, I'm going to weigh in, along with others, on a bipartisan basis uh, to make sure that whatever amount we identify, uh, if we identify that additional cuts need to be made to the Department of Defense, they will be left up to the Secretary of Defense. That's where it should be. Congress should not dictate a percentage. The reason that that was put in the law, by the way, which I opposed again, I oppose that because I don't think that we ought to, we ought to subvert our authority and give it to 12 people because we saw the results of that. And secondly, we each one of us has a responsibility to represent our districts. My district here, uh, we've always been a strong military community. I want to continue to work to uh, uh, support Fort Bliss and the potential cuts uh, that may, uh, may be coming. So that's an important uh, distinction from being a very senior member of the Armed Services Committee to being a freshman in who knows what other committee. I'm also uh, the second most senior uh, member of the Veterans Committee. I get a chance to weigh in. In fact, uh, the chairman recently sent me to Houston to evaluate the VA hospital there so that uh, long term, as we talk about doing a VA hospital here in El, in El Paso, uh, we're able to be that much further ahead by having visited successful uh, VA uh, uh, hospitals around the, around the country. We're living in tough economic times. We're living under very uh, austere potential budgets, uh, but you need somebody that knows how to navigate uh, in Congress, how to work with people on both sides of the aisle. As chairman, I supported many programs and projects that were important to my colleagues so that uh, uh, today I've got the opportunity and the ability to work with them to make things happen here for El Paso. Thank you. Uh, 
Bob, the, the question for me is which committee? Which, co uh, which committee would you like to serve on and how would you use that position to benefit El Paso? First, let me say this. Um, well, I'll answer the question first. The, the committee I would most like to serve on is Veterans Affairs. And for the reasons that I've, that I've already explained, and I'll go into a little more. But let me respond to the Congressman's assertion about seniority and connections. Those things matter. Your 15 or 16 years in Congress matter if you're able to deliver on those connections and on that seniority and improve things in El Paso. Now, in 2008, the VA system was ranked the worst, not in this region, not in this state, but in the entire United States of America. Here with 80,000 veterans, here with 35,000 active duty soldiers and their families. This should be the best VA system in the country. Now, if this had happened during Congressman Reyes's first term, or second term, or third term, or fourth term, or fifth term, maybe that would be excusable. But this has happened well into his career, and there really is no excuse for that. I will make that a focus. I will measure that. I will meet with area veterans on a quarterly basis. When my opponent first ran for office 16 years ago, he pledged to have an annual town hall meeting. The last live in-person in El Paso town hall meeting that he's had on a regular basis, I understand, was nine years ago. You now have the privilege, if you're a veteran, of calling into a teleconference town hall meeting where if you press button number nine and you can wait 30 minutes, you may be lucky enough to ask a question. We need to do better for our veterans. I will do better for our veterans. And look, if you don't believe me, if you don't want to take my word for it, ask one of the hundreds of veterans I've met as I've knocked on thousands of doors around this community who tell me about four to six months waiting time to receive an appointment. When that appointment is scheduled, it gets rescheduled for another four to six months. There's inadequate care, there's inadequate capacity for the number of veterans that we have in our community, and we absolutely must improve that. I will do that. I'm making it a priority, and I want you to hold me accountable for that. So when the Congressman's local chief of staff, Sal Payan, says at a breakfast meeting, 99.9% .9 of veterans here are absolutely satisfied with the VA system, you know that this Congressman and his staff are out of touch with this community. I've been talking to them for the last three months. They say we need to do better, and under my leadership, we will. Yeah, committee selection for me, I would certainly agree with, uh, with, with Beto. We need to have uh, uh, a stronger voice in veterans affairs. I would take a look also at uh, ways and means and armed services. Let me start with veterans affairs. Uh, you're speaking to a guy who knows what it's like because he's been out there and come back, talk to veterans because I've been in the foxholes that guys in Congress have only read about. And I can speak to those issues more specifically than everybody else uh, up here, specifically from the standpoint of being in one of the most recent wars that the United States has fought. I say Veterans Affairs because uh, for some of you uh, who know Washington, D.C., and some of you who do not, the Capitol is about 10 miles from Walter Reed. But we've read about it in the Washington Post that the services and conditions were so dismal that that place has since been condemned and is now being rebuilt. There's a reason for that. If we profess to care so much in Congress, about what the veterans are, that should not have been a surprise to anybody on Capitol Hill who could have taken a cab ride, a bus ride, or driven up there themselves to see what those conditions were. So we need to make sure we have a voice that reflects the true priorities, and I want to say that for being a veteran, I know about those kinds of things because I was in the foxhole next to some of the guys who have the services or the need the services that they're asking for now from, from Veterans Affairs. Ways and means we need to talk about better ways of spending. We have got to get out of this habit of just swiping the, the national credit card and then anytime we need to have the credit rating or the credit limit updated, we simply put that crucifix on the backs of everybody who's sitting in the room. Uh, armed services, again, because of the combat experiences, because I have been a part of those things that the United States has chosen to deploy forces for, the expertise that I bring to the table is the kind of thing that I think the Congress is lacking because so many are there who have no idea, no clue, no experience, have never put on a pair of combat boots, have never been forward deployed, but always talk about wanting to lead a country for which they have never fought and they would never fight. The next question is a uh, panelist question where there's some latitude here to ask um, 
either all the candidates the same question or to individualize uh, the next question for each candidate. And uh, <coughs> we'll start off again with Mr. Bob. <coughs> One of the uh, issues that's going to be addressed uh, this coming term by the Supreme Court could have a major impact on the next election, and that's the review of the health care law that was passed uh, uh, in uh, uh, the, the current Congress. Uh, um, the, one of the issues before the court deals with the constitutionality of the individual mandate. So I'm curious, if the court were to strike down the health care law as unconstitutional, what efforts would uh, the candidates commit to on health care in the next Congress? Well, the, the first thing for me would be to take a look at what I believe some of the positive points were with the current health care plan uh, as passed by, uh, by uh, the, the Congress. I like the idea of being able to extend insurance benefits for parents who have children in the public education system, who have children in post-secondary education, and because of the dismal state of affairs for us economically, can still have an umbrella of protection health-wise until the economic situation in the United States improves. So I would certainly take a very strong and hard look at that one. The other points uh, would have to be studied a bit more, but that one specifically, that if you can extend those benefits and take those worries away from somebody who has gone out, incurred the kinds of debt that many of our college students have incurred, uh, to then graduate and step out into a barren labor force, they need to have those kinds of basic tangible protections, and that would be one big thing that I would stay focused on, stay tuned with, to make sure that we can extend health care benefits to those people who are still out there trying to find a job. I, I think the Health Care Act uh, tried to address many important issues. We had people who had pre-existing conditions who could not get coverage. That needed to be addressed. We had over 31% of our fellow El Paso ones who could not or did not have health insurance. That needed to be addressed. We had people who had caps on their lifetime coverage. So if they had chronic or catastro catastrophic injuries or diseases, they might run out of coverage. That needed to be addressed. And so I'm glad that the Health Care Act tried to address those issues. Here's what was not addressed and needed to be improved, and if it is struck down by the Supreme Court, these are the issues that I'll work on. El Paso has a patient-to-doctor ratio of 126 doctors per 100,000 uh, patients. Nationally, it's 200 per 100,000. We need to close that gap. But guess what? Our reimbursement rate is a fraction of the reimbursement rate that doctors and health professionals get in other communities around this country and in Texas. If I were in Congress and the Health Care Act was being proposed, I would have been fighting tooth and claw for my community to make sure that we got the great reimbursement rates or at least just parity with the rest of the country so that we can attract and recruit doctors here and so that we have the kind of health care provision that this community desperately needs. That's what I would have done and that's what I will work on doing if I'm your next congressman. The, the other uh, issue related to that is coverage does not equal access. If we mandate that every single person in this community has coverage, has health insurance, but we don't have the health care providers in this area to provide that, then you aren't going to get the kind of services and attention to your needs that you deserve and, and need. So I will work on doctor recruitment. I'll work on investing in areas like the Medical Center of the Americas, which is our best long-term opportunity for job growth economic growth and medical attention in this community. We have some great starting pieces to that with the University Medical Center, the Children's Hospital, uh, and, some, and, and the first four-year medical sp school built in this country in decades. We need to capitalize on that, continue to invest in that, and I think that leadership can be improved at the congressional level. So those are some areas that I think we can do a better job on, uh, regardless of whether or not this current law is upheld. There's a lot of work left to be done, and I look forward to doing that for El Paso. Well, at the, at the height of the uh, health care debate, and I hope everybody remembers how contentious that was, that actually gave uh, birth to the Tea Party movement, who sent 87 new members of Congress uh, in the last election cycle uh, to Congress, and who have controlled the agenda on the Republican side of the House uh, uh, since uh, last uh, January. So it's been a very difficult environment in being able to work anything through 
with uh, those 87 plus another 30 or so uh, that really choke the ability of the House of Representatives to do anything uh, meaningful other than do symbolic uh, type votes. Let me, uh, let me just commit that uh, uh, I went through those debates. I, ha I held both telephonic and live town halls to give people an opportunity to, to give feedback, and I think it was worthwhile. Because I had heard from families that had gone bankrupt because of the lifetime limits that the health care uh, uh, insurance policies have. When we talk about the Reimbursement Act, I voted to cover the doctor's reimbursement 100%. We passed that in the House of Representatives. Where it failed was in the Senate, because Mitch McConnell and those other guys had enough votes to not uh, have cloture on the Senate. The Senate has some very strange rules. But we actually voted and passed full reimbursement going forward into the future, 100% in the House of Representatives. I took that vote. Uh, it's exciting to have uh, the first medical school uh, in the last three decades or so here in this country, and it's here on the border. I have brought in about $7.5, $7.8 million uh, uh, to that effort here in my tenure uh, in Congress. Uh, so uh, you have somebody that has actually gone through the process, somebody that has talked to families and constituents here that were impacted severely by the situation with affordable uh, health care. So uh, first of all, I don't think the Supreme Court is going to uh, uh, rule that that law is unconstitutional. But if it does, I am going to continue to do everything as a member of Congress uh, uh, to make sure that we continue to act on that. 233,000 people were without health care coverage here just in El, in El Paso. Today, because of that law, that's gone down to somewhere around 215, 218,000. Uh, so we're making progress. We knew that the, the law that we passed was not a perfect piece of legislation. But in Congress, you try to do the best you can so that uh, you have the votes to ensure that it's passed. Then, then in subsequent Congresses, uh, you move forward to address those areas uh, that uh, needed uh, that needed attention maybe initially, but we couldn't cobble enough votes uh, to pass it. That's the way the the system worked. But I am 100% committed uh, to uh, the comprehensive uh, health care uh, reform legislation. I voted for it. I I was at the table because I was a full chair, and and that means. Uh, uh, that uh, you get a chance to weigh in on all the kinds of issues that ultimately come out as legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, for, uh, an individual question for each candidate. And I, I assume the doctor does as well. How, how do you ask one candidate? You start off and direct it at the candidate, okay. candidate if you wish. All right. I, I, I to thank you. <clears throat> My first question is for uh, Mr. Tillman. Uh, and I think it's appropriate considering you're all running for the Democratic nomination uh, and you're addressing a partisan organization. Most of my questions will be uh, about Democratic Party values or issues. Uh, Mr. Tillman, uh, the Tea Party has been against immigrants, it's been against the gay community, it's been against the poor. Yet earlier this year, you were not only a guest of the Tea Party, you gave the keynote address earlier this year to the Tea Party. In just a few brief words, why should Democrats support you for the nomination? I could get the support of the Democratic Party because when I went to speak to the Tea Party, it was designed to let them know that the ways and means that they were using to push the legislation forward without attempting to build some consensus in this community was destined to fail. If you look at the accounts of the presentation that I made to the persons at the Tea Party, it was designed to say the name of the game is cooperation, not competition. If you take a look at some of the thinking that goes on between and among political entities in the community, we take a look at making a, I'm speaking metaphorically now, furnishing the best cabin on a cruise ship that's about to smash against an iceberg. 
We have got to understand that the name of the game is dialogue, compromise, and consensus. And my message to them and my message to anybody here is you have got to be willing to find flexibility in the positions that you take because when we go to the line of scrimmage, we are all going to have to move this team down the field and everybody has to do their individual part to do that. I was happy to get the call to be able to give them a message of dialogue, compromise, and consensus building. I thought the message was well received. I thought it was well covered uh, in the newspaper. And it goes to show you that there are people on the opposite side who are willing to listen to Jamal Tillman. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Congressman Reyes. Uh, Congressman Reyes, uh, Representative O'Rourke said in an article in yesterday's edition of the El Paso Times that the Super Committee's failure uh, to pass a, uh, a budget fell partially on your shoulders. Uh, he said you would support the Budget Control Act. You said you'd vote against it. Can you please explain why you would vote that way? Sure, and, and in the past I should point out uh, my opponent has said that he would have voted against it as well, so it's, I, I don't know what, how he, he actually feels, but I can tell you why I voted against it. Uh, first and foremost, um, uh, the law uh, asked us to abdicate our individual responsibilities and put them all together in 12 members uh, of Congress, six from the Senate and six from the House. I was elected and sent uh, to Congress to represent the 700,000 or so people of the 16th District. Uh, I sat on the sidelines while they debated all of those things. Uh, I voted against that because uh, I thought uh, that was not in keeping with the, with the uh, constitutional system that was set up for representing 700,000 people from the, from the 16th uh, uh, district. In addition to that, if you remember how contentious uh, it was, uh, uh, we had never made a, made a political issue of raising the debt ceiling uh, until this time. When uh, my, my opponent on the far end there uh, talks about going to the, to the Tea Party folks here locally uh, and uh, uh, asking them to draw a consensus, we have a pretty good indicator from the 87 that went to Congress uh, that they're not interested in consensus. In fact, I have had many conversations uh, with, those, with those members, because some of them sit, sit on the Armed Services Committee, uh, and they're not interested in negotiations, they're not interested in compromise, they're interested in cutting the government and making it smaller. Uh, that's that's what why they feel they were sent uh, to Congress. So I'm not sure how successful uh, we can be with that uh, uh, with that attitude and that mentality. When we have members sitting in Congress right now, and I I tell you it's embarrassing to have an eight or nine percent uh, approval rating as a as a whole. Uh, but my job is not to go around and preach to other members of Congress. My job is to find a way to work within that system, and I have, uh, to make sure that I go to the, to the people on the Republican side of the aisle, uh, that I have a relationship and that they have uh, a trust with me to be able to continue to get things done. We have to have that kind of uh, understanding uh, at the federal level uh, now more than ever because uh, uh, you're not dealing with what I call rational uh, individuals that uh, once they get elected turn their, turn their uh, uh, work towards consensus and governing. That, that, that's not who they are and that's not what they're doing. Thank you. The final question is for Representative O'Rourke. Representative O'Rourke, a big part of the Democratic Party's base are unions, in El Paso specifically. Public unions play a big role, like teachers, firefighters, and police officers. <coughs> While you were a member of city council, you uh, gave a quote to the El Paso Times that said, I think the police union is out of control, and it makes me question the need and wisdom of having a police union in El Paso. Why should union uh, members support you for Congress? I believe a, a core democratic value is taking care of the people who've taken care of us. And that's why along with the rest of the city council, 
we voted uh, to fund the pension shortfall for our police and firefighters to the tune of $200 million. It's a big sacrifice for us to make. It squeezes out other priorities in the city's budget, and it saddles the community with debt that they have to pay off for many years. And I think that was a significant sacrifice that we all made on behalf of our firefighters and our police officers, the right thing to do. Now, when the city budget was in a pinch and our economy was going into recession and you and I in the community were not receiving uh, pay increases, when many of us were losing our jobs, we asked the police union to uh, sacrifice a little bit and not take a pay increase, a merit increase, and a COLA increase uh, in, their, in, in that year. And uh, the intransigence of the union, uh, the pushback when so many of my constituents were suffering uh, and needed help, uh, to me was uh, unexcusable. And so uh, I used some tough language because I was fighting back for my constituents and for their needs. And, and that's essentially the, the battle that you see play out every time there is a police or in sometimes a firefighter's contract presented at the city. But I think I was always fair uh, to both those unions and their memberships. Uh, in, in, you know, example A is, is bailing out that, that pension shortfall. And the second point is I believe in the right to unionize. I believe that unions have brought us some of the uh, amazing uh, things that we enjoy in our, in our work life, starting with uh, the weekend, starting with the 40-day work week, starting with uh, the fact that you don't have child labor in this community anymore. But there does need to be a balance. There does need to be uh, uh, an equilibrium that's reached where the taxpayer is protected, uh, where the union members are protected. And that's, that's what I thought my, my job was uh, on, on the city council. Uh, and so I will continue to support unions, but I will also continue to fight for the taxpayer, and I will also continue to, reach, to, to fight to reach that balance that I think is most appropriate for our community and our country. Dr. Stout. I have two great questions, and I would invite uh, any or all uh, candidates to respond, but to keep their responses to a minute or less. <clears throat> My first question is this. 2011 has been called the year of the war on women. Earlier this year, House Republicans and a handful of Democrats voted against the 1970 National Family Planning Act called Title X. Um, including our own incumbent. Uh, what are your positions on low or no cost family planning, i.e. birth control, uh, and for women's health care in the future? I'll go first, since I already on that. First of all, the uh, wage disparity between women and men has got to be closed. That's a gap that, uh, that's sinful in the community, sinful in the country. And I would certainly speak to attempt to correct that. The other thing, in terms of being characterized as war on women uh, and, the, uh, and the acts that were put forward to diminish their access to the health benefits we're talking about, I think those things need to, to be changed. You cannot legislate morality if there is an issue such as a woman's right to choose that needs to be respected uh, and it needs to be supported legislatively. The Supreme Court has already spoken to that issue for us very, very clearly and very directly and I think that it is a role and a responsibility that we have to say if that's the law of the land, that is the law that I must follow unless and until that law changes. To this question and, and the question asked earlier about democratic values, you know, we have a, a congressman who uh, voted for the Patriot Act and, and warrantless wiretapping. We have a congressman who in 1999 voted to deregulate the banks and the financial institutions, which brought us to where we are today. And at the top of the heap, we have, uh, in, in terms of what I think are undemocratic or non-democratic party values, we have a congressman who voted to defund Planned Parenthood. <laughs> And regardless of your opinion on abortion or on family planning, what this effectively meant to low and moderate income women is that they had less or no access to screenings for cancers, including ovarian cancer and breast cancer, if Planned Parenthood had been defunded. In many cases, that is the last and best opportunity for them to receive this much needed uh, health care. And so I think that's unconscionable. I think it's undemocratic. And it's something that I'm ashamed of from our congressman.
and you should focus on uh, learning the system and not worry about uh, taking on the load for me because I can speak for myself. I have a track record that I'm proud of. In fact, uh, I have an 88% uh, favorability ratio with the human rights campaign. I don't always vote 100% uh, uh, on probably every issue as, as a 15-year uh, incumbent in, in Congress. There are often times that, that uh, we are asked to weigh in for uh, uh, purposes of getting something to the, to the uh, conference committee. Uh, but those are, those are things that, that we do uh, as members uh, for our leadership. Now, I have two daughters, and, and more than that, as I travel around the world and talk to women serving in our armed forces, they're very much concerned about the kinds of issues that Dr. Stout, Stout uh, mentioned here. Uh, so, although personally, I, personally I'm, a, I'm a Catholic and, I, and I'm pro-life, I have uh, a track record of not voting 100% on either issue. In fact, if you will check with Planned Parenthood, my uh, voting record uh, uh, on their issues is almost 70%. So uh, uh, that's, that's part of what you have to do as a, as a member of Congress, do the kinds of things uh, uh, that uh, represent your community, represent the democratic uh, values, uh, and more than that is uh, stand up uh, and be part of the debate on those kinds of issues, which which I have been uh, as a as a member of Congress. The uh, the issue of let me just speak briefly. The issue of unions this year in particular, we heard uh, uh, and we saw uh, the impact when people attack unions and vote against. Uh, collective bargaining. Uh, we saw that play out and we saw uh, consequences of that uh, in an election. We're all held accountable and uh, as an incumbent I can't straddle the fence like my opponents can. I can't say I, voted, I would have voted against the Budget Act and then weeks later say I uh, now want to vote for it. I can't say that my number one priority is this but now uh, after being in the campaign, it turns to veterans and the economy and all of those kinds of things. I have the track record. Uh, I am proud to defend my track record on everything. But most of all, let me just tell you again, uh, as a senior member of both the Armed Services Committee, which uh, one aspires to get on, uh, and the Veterans Committee, which is apparently today the, the priority of the other uh, opponent, uh, I'm there where I'm making an actual difference. And uh, it's important as we go into the next Congress and we face the kinds of potential cutbacks that will affect uh, our lives. Thank you. My final question relates to the word security. The word security has been used frequently against real and imaginary threats. Yet environmental security is virtually invisible. There's a Belgian-owned chemical plant named Solve that produces hydrofluoric acid uh, in Ciudad Juarez uh, with a dangerous track record. Uh, and uh, methodical research has indicated that it is possibly linked uh, to a Bhopal-type uh, disaster. <coughs> you may remember Bhopal, India, uh, in previous decades. Um, the air, of course, knows no borders. Uh, and environmental uh, emergency people on both sides of the border have expressed concerns uh, about the inspection uh, and resources available in Mexico to deal with this. What would you do to safeguard environmental security at the border? We have a common air shed. Mother Nature determines the direction of, of the wind, determines the weather. But our conversations about what goes in, those particulates that may enter into the atmosphere, are conversations we need to have between governments. And I believe that information that we gather from a study of its long-term damaging effects needs to be the first thing we discuss talk about the tangible negative effects of not addressing 
the pollutants that are damaging us health-wise needs to be the first order of business. We are close enough to talk about those things with a government if that government has in its priority list those same kinds of things. We see that the government of Mexico is deluged with things that cause them to focus on issues other than the health welfare of its people because of this enormous drug war. We've got to get that solved and out the way so we can talk about how to develop key strategies to address the damaging and inimical effects of particulates and pollutants being introduced into the environment. We've got to get tangible numbers, a solid track record of the damages as a consequence, and develop means to negate or reverse the negative health trends that have been created as a result of our ignoring the environment in this community. This, this is a great question because El Paso Juarez is the second or third largest manufacturing platform in North America. So there's a lot of opportunity that comes with that, but there's a lot of risk and a lot of danger. And I think we've seen a lack of leadership on border issues from the federal level, including our congressmen, and including in environmental issues like this one. To, to look at another facet of this, you have an opera, uh, a, a neighborhood, uh, the, the larger part of it, of almost 500,000 in Juarez that's served by one high school. You have uh, plants producing uh, toxins and chemicals that don't have the appropriate regulation. You have three-hour waits at our international ports of entry that are adding pollutants and toxins and particulate matter uh, to the air and the environment and poisoning the people who live in this community. So instead of investing $1.4 billion in the Merida Initiative, which is aimed at the war on drugs, which funds things like helicopters and scanning equipment and war materiel, why not invest in environmental safeguards and controls in social infrastructure like high schools, uh, community centers, the kind of things that Juarez really needs, that our community really need, if we're going to prosper and succeed and make the most of our opportunities and advantages. I don't see that happening right now. I would make that my focus as your congressman. Well, first, first of all, as a member of Congress, the good news is you get to weigh in on many, many different issues. The bad news is you cannot lead an invasion into a, a sovereign nation, no matter uh, that it's located on our, on our own border. But what you can do is you can look at my track record as, as it relates to environmental issues. Uh, let me f go back to when they wanted to make Sierra Blanca the dump site for uh, uh, nuclear waste. I led the effort here locally in concert with uh, Jeffrey Jones, who, who then was the, the state senator uh, for Chihuahua on an international uh, basis. He came to Washington, D.C. At, uh, at my request and testified about the impact, the potential impact that that would have on the largest international uh, community in the world. So I led that effort. It was successful. That dump site is now located uh, uh, in Nevada, that uh, where presumably it's not going to impact uh, any populated uh, area. So, so I've been there. I have done that. But I also want to tell you is uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, make promises because as a as an incumbent, you're held accountable for your track record. As a candidate, you can you can say whatever you want and have whatever priorities, as unrealistic as they may be, uh, that uh, that's how you were gonna, gonna change the world. Let me also close by telling you, I was in Dallas to swear in the new EPA administrator. Uh, Alan Mendez is from here, from El Paso. He has been taking on the tough issues in, uh, uh, at, at the federal level as the director for this region of the EPA. We have been working closely on those kinds of issues. As you know, we've got a governor that uh, is very loose with the environment uh, and uh, uh, as, as well as border security, I might add. This is a, a governor that famously said that bombs were going off in downtown El Paso. I stood up and said, you're full of baloney. Uh, there hasn't been a single bomb going off in, in El Paso. As, uh, in fact, El Paso is the safest city, and I am honored to represent 
that city. He's also uh, the governor that said that's not sure whether Juarez is located in Mexico or the United States. But be that as it may, uh, I'm standing with the EPA administrator and taking on the issues uh, of uh, the environment, not just here locally, but across the state and across uh, his region. I have a track record that I'm proud of. I was born and raised on a farm where we learned the value of respecting Mother Nature. I want my kids and my grandkids to live in a safe community. So anything and everything that I can do, I will do as a member of Congress, with the exception of overpromising stuff that I can't deliver. Thank you. We're, we're down to our fifth and final question uh, before we have final re remarks. And for that, I'd like to refer that question to Mr. Bob Moore, the El Paso Times. Thank you. Uh, the final question is, uh, when you look at reducing the national debt, what areas would you consider for fiscal cuts, and are there areas that you would avoid cutting? Can't uh, we can start with the Congress. Okay. Well, first of all, I would not touch Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Those are vital and important programs uh, that, we, that we must uh, defend. As I mentioned earlier, there are areas... Uh, that uh, we can leave to the discretion of the Secretary of Defense if we're talking about uh, uh, DOD, uh, additional DOD uh, cutbacks. Uh, what's important there is to make sure uh, that, that the incumbent or the member of Congress from here, which as an incumbent I am, uh, has a good working relationship uh, with the Secretary of Defense. Liam Panetta is a friend of mine. Uh, he was the director of the CIA when I was chairman of the uh, uh, Intelligence Committee. I have worked closely with him on many different national security issues. Fort Bliss for me and for us is a national security uh, issue that I fully intend to weigh in on. Uh, in January, Leon Panetta is coming here at my invitation uh, to look at uh, uh, Fort Bliss, but most importantly, to get in his mind clearly an understanding of why it's vital and important that we continue the building of the $1.2 uh, billion dollar complex, uh, uh, the new William, William Beaumont. Uh, that, that will be helpful because as he looks, which I hope uh, we do this, as he looks at ways to cut back, that he remembers the faces of the soldiers and the families that are going to uh, have a lifeline in the new William Beaumont uh, uh, Hospital. Uh, I think it's important that uh, we are as fiscally responsible uh, as we can be. I voted against the going into, into Iraq. Uh, we, do, we should have never gone uh, in there. At the time, everybody thought it was a dumb vote. I think history has, has uh, shown otherwise. Uh, part of uh, the responsibility of an incumbent is to be able sit, to sit down at the negotiating table uh, with both members of the other party and your own party uh, and work out a workable solution. As a result of the work that I've done in Congress, uh, I have an outstanding relationship uh, with both uh, uh, Leader Pelosi and Speaker Boehner. Uh, it's a tough environment for Speaker Boehner because of those 87 votes that I told you about, uh, but nonetheless, I can go and sit down and speak to uh, uh, Mr. Boehner and, of course, uh, uh, Leader Pelosi on the issues that are important to us here. In fact, I have invited and she has accepted uh, Leader Pelosi to come here uh, and uh, one of the priorities will be to sit down with the board of the Medical Center of the Americas because if we take back <coughs> control of the House next year, uh, I want her uh, to be on our side as we fight for, for uh, uh, resources for the, for the Medical Center of the Americas as well. Thank you. This is precisely why people are so frustrated with Congress right now and why it has the lowest approval rating in U.S. history. The question was, uh, we have an out-of-control debt. Where would you cut? I don't know if anyone heard an answer. We heard about voting against Iraq. We heard about bringing Nancy Pelosi here to El Paso. I want to know where our congressman would cut. 
because those are the kind of tough decisions that we send him and our next congressman up to Washington, D.C. to make. Those are the kind of tough decisions that I made as a city council representative who was part of passing a balanced budget every single year. That means that we had to look at where the revenues were coming in from. That means we had to look at what programs we were going to cut and what programs we were going to keep. I will do that for you in the U.S. Congress. To answer the question, we spend 43% of the world's military budget right now. We are completely overextended overseas. It's unsustainable, and that's the first place that we need to look at cutting. We're in two wars. One of those wars in Afghanistan is stretching into its second decade. We just launched, uh, got into another engagement in Libya that thankfully uh, has ended well. But we have the world's largest uh, military budget. We spend more than almost all militaries combined. I think that we can responsibly cut back in our uh, extension overseas. I think that we need to bring troops back from Afghanistan, back from Iraq, to bases like Fort Bliss. I think we need to look at closing bases that we have all over this world and uh, responsibly uh, shrink our military presence overseas. Look, it's not an easy thing to talk about. It wouldn't be an easy thing to do, but those are some of the tough decisions that we have to make if we're gonna get our budget under control. Social Security. The people who paid into Social Security and who are earning uh, their checks back from their investment into Social Security, that needs to be protected. That's inviolable. But going forward for future generations, for my kids' generation, five, three, and one-year-old right now, we need to look at things like means testing. We need to look at perhaps a, a longer, uh, uh, a later age at which my kids are going to retire. That's a tough decision. It's not easy to say it's going to be politicized by my opponent, but those are the tough things that you're going to want me to weigh in on when I'm in Washington, D.C. This is precisely why the U.S. almost defaulted on its national debt this summer, and the incumbent voted against the compromise that was reached so that, that prevented us from defaulting on the national debt. This was after our debt rating was downgraded by Standard & Poor. So we have a Congress that can't get the job done. It's a do-nothing Congress. We have a congressman who's been up there for almost 16 years who's part of the problem. You need to send someone up to Washington who's going to make the tough decisions that are necessary to move our country forward, not for our generation, but for our kids' generation and our grandkids' generation. If we don't do that, we'll lose this country. And we can do much better, and as your congressman, I will. The Department of Education is uh, contributing about six, maybe eight percent to the education budget. Uh, they have too much say so, they have too much sway. I think uh, they could be sizably reduced, and uh, I would even talk about an elimination because most of the, the pick and shovel work that needs to be done in education happens out or below the state level. I think that the Defense Department has a footprint that's too large in one corner of the world. We're talking about Southwest Asia, 44,000 still in Iraq, 100,000 in Afghanistan. Talking about a stand down in Iraq, only to stand up in, in Uganda. The places I would take a look at the cut would be in Department of Education and in Defense, what things I believe are sacrosanct. We need to show that we appreciate the people who are on Social Security because they have largely built the economy and the wealth that this country is resting on uh, right now. One thing we need to take a very strong look at in terms of our long-term economic benefit has got to be in education. I want to speak very quickly about the DREAM Act. Our birth rate is not anywhere near what it used to be. Our mortuary tables have changed, people are living longer, but if we do not find a way to feed the labor force of today with qualified individuals, then it will be difficult to sustain the very entitlement programs that we have. If you have an undereducated labor force, they will not be able to earn the wages that produce the taxes to take care of the people who are living longer. We have got to do things to make sure that the population that is going into the labor force now is qualified, is able to produce well economically, to sustain the programs we have in terms of entitlement. I think that in one comment that the, the congressman made, when he said we cannot go into the, a country like Mexico, alluding to possibly invading, and I simply say that in special operations, 
You don't have to have that large of a footprint. But if we're willing to go into Pakistan to deal with a guy called Osama bin Laden without anybody's permission, if we see a national threat, we don't need to have a consensus of nations to determine how best to address that if we know we can do it right away. So, Defense Department footprint's too big. We've got to reduce that. Special operations can take care of that. The Department of Education, only 6%. Uh, goes into what we do at the, at the state level, we need to reduce and possibly eliminate that, uh, that department. And we need to make sure that we're doing things that is going to grow a qualified labor force to take care of the numbers of unemployed, underemployed, low-wage uh, low individuals, and the low per capita medium in, in income. Thank you. In conclusion to today's forum, um, we, we will have each candidate give their, their final remarks, and, and uh, we want to limit this to two, no more than two minutes, and we'll, we'll, and it's, we'll start with Jerome Tillman. First of all, thank you very much for being here. Our social, economic, and political future of this community and this country is in the classroom right now. If you take a look at policies and programs that have been authored by two people who have been in the public arena for as long as they have, you would think that we would have a better unemployment rate. You would think that we would have a better per capita income. You would think that we would have a smaller gap between median income for the average American and the El Paso. I submit to you that the policies that have been authored and parented by these individuals have created the economic situations we face locally and we face nationally. Any investment, I believe, in continuing the, the candidacy here is a down payment on the status quo. The Council Representative Beto O'Rourke, I, I feel, has uh, done what he says is his best. I believe that the Congressman believes that he, had, he has done his best. But you got to ask yourself the question, is this the best result we can expect for the policy direction that these persons have taken? I submit that the numbers are on the wall, as we say in poker, read them and weep. Poverty has been on the page and paragraph of every chapter in El Paso's history in my 22 years here. And I submit that it's a combination of the policies at the local level and the national level that have put us here. I think that we have a stronger capability to do better if we were led in a better direction. I submit that my role, my responsibility in Congress will be to create the best foundation that we can so that we can recover from the dismal situation that we're in right now. Thank you very much, and I would appreciate you voting the primaries. It's, it's clear to me, and I think it's clear to most all of us here today, that Congress is broken. As an institution, it no longer serves my interests. Uh, I don't think it serves this community's interests, and I don't think it serves this country's interests. Look at our economy, perhaps heading back into recession. Look at our unemployment rate in El Paso, almost 11%, 35,000 El Pasoans out of work. And look at some of these really difficult issues like the national debt. Congress just cannot get the job done. They've, been, they've put partisanship and their careers ahead of this country and our community. Our incumbent has been there now for eight terms, almost 16 years. He is part of this Congress that is unable to get this job done for our community and for our country. It seems that the Congress's number one job, including the incumbent, is to get reelected and to stay in power. And if that's their number one priority, they're doing a great job. Their reelection rate is something like 90%. And it makes a lot of sense when you look around you today, I see members of the Congressman's DC staff here at a political event, taxpayer expense, uh, supporting the Congressman. So if you want taxpayer funded campaigns, you've got them right here. It's part of the power of incumbency. It's part of why we're disgusted with Washington DC. It's part of why we need new leadership if we expect things to change there. But if you want to judge this Congressman and the US Congress on our community's priorities, not his personal priorities, he's done a terrible job. 11% unemployment. The worst ranked VA system well into his career as our congressional representative. 
and not the most responsive or accountable person in terms of holding regularly scheduled meetings for constituents, for veterans, for the groups who depend on his leadership and his activity in the U.S. Congress. If you want more for your community, if you expect better things, if you expect an unemployment rate that's below the national average instead of ahead of it, if you expect the best VA system in the country instead of the worst, then you're going to need to change who you send up to Washington, D.C. I see great things happening at the local level, from local elected leaders to the business community to the nonprofit community. There, there's a wonderful transformation and an amazing spirit taking hold in El Paso today. That is not matched and complemented at the federal level, and it's not matched and complemented by who we send to the U.S. Congress every year for the last 16 years. So I do not think it is in El Paso's interest, it is not in your interest or my interest, to send the same person back there for a ninth term, for a 17th and an 18th year. It's the very definition of insanity to continue to do the same thing and expect a different result. So if you want something better for this community, if you expect more out of yourself, out of our community, and out of our country, then I'm asking for your vote and your support and your help in this election, and I appreciate your consideration and your attendance today. Thank you very much. Let me, let me add my, my thanks to uh, uh, Ken and all of you that are, that are here for being here for this uh, uh, first debate uh, that will end in the primary in, in March. Uh, if, you, if you're talking about uh, sending someone to Congress, the highest elected position uh, here in this uh, community, uh, and, and we're all Democrats here, presumably, um, that's what's at stake. Uh, do you want to send someone back with a proven track record? Do you want to send somebody back that uh, uh, talks to constituents? I live here. My home is about 10 minutes away uh, from here. I go and represent the district uh, in, in Congress during the week, and I come home on weekends. I see many of you as I accompany my wife or go by myself and do the shopping and all of the kinds of things that regular people do here in this community. The difference is I know the importance of continuing to work to bring federal dollars uh, here into the uh, uh, El Paso uh, region. I know that veterans get the best health care because I'm a veteran. I've been not in a foxhole but in a helicopter flying over the jungles of Vietnam getting shot at. I care about veterans. I don't have to tell you it's my number one priority. My uh, uh, priority has, has always been to make sure that uh, the national security of this country is protected and veterans are part uh, of that. Jobs, all you've got to do is look, look around. We largely uh, avoided the, the, the impact of the economic uh, downturn because of the work that I did uh, for Fort Bliss. If you're looking for somebody that knows and understands border security, someone that weighs in with Secretary Napolitano and Secretary Clinton about national security and border uh, security, someone that is consulted on both sides of the aisle and from the Senate as well, uh, and will continue to dedicate that work. I work hard. I understand uh, uh, what it takes to be successful uh, in representing this great district. Uh, so today it's about who are you going to send back as Democrats? Uh, someone that knows and understands and, and has a proven track record? Or opponents that you heard here this morning use Republican talking points? Cutting out the Department of Education. Uh, doing the kinds of things that Republicans have always targeted and that is Social Security. One of my opponents is wealthy, so he doesn't have to worry about his kids going on Social Security. I care because everybody else uh, in this district, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are important. So thank you for listening. Uh, you've got a decision to make. Uh, I would appreciate and would be honored to continue uh, to support this, this great district. Thank you. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. Um, you can go.